Okay, let's, let's go. go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome to In Frame Podcast. This is episode eight. Episode nine. eight. Eight. Episode eight. Yes. Like the Star Wars trilogy, we cannot keep track. Of <laughs> so, um, oh no. Yeah, this is episode eight. Episode and- eight. So yeah, so if you if you do end up catching Twain, he can talk your ear off about color for i don't know like a a good five ten minutes and then it depends on what you're talking about though like it depends on what you ask no one like mentions no 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 it doesn't depend about what you ask you mention color and twain all of a sudden zero to 100 (laughs) it'll go on a tangent um it can be zero to 100 i will say but that i mean like you're passionate about color and so that's understandable that you can talk about like if somebody asks me about um, I don't know, like something about cooking. I can go off for ages about that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this this podcast episode is dedicated to color science. Um, and again, like Twain mentioned, you know, if you are a colorist and you're listening or watching to this. I mean, if you um, are a colorist and you're listening or watching this, <laughs> judge me as you will if, you, <laughs> if I'm saying things that are incorrect. But I, I felt I feel like I've, I've spent the pandemic. Mm hmm learning about this space yeah. and whilst i don't know everything um i i love learning about the ins and outs of color science so okay that's been the process for me so far okay well the first question for you in a nutshell um is what is color science because a lot of people they just know color they just know you know vseo f- film presets or whatever um what is color science well i'll tell you this color science is not vseo <laughs> film presets i mean there is probably some color science to be had with that process and and presets Mm. and things like that but color science in a nutshell is basically taking the light that hits your sensor Mm -hmm. and translating that digitally into what we see with our eyes and what we perceive with our eyes so if it comes to a regular sensor it's it's taking light and and hitting those pixels those rgb pixels and then converting that uh, into into a pleasing image, whatever by which whatever way that happens, you know. So um, it 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 can get very complicated. It can get very technical. But in essence, that's what color science is, really. Okay. Know? So all right. Well, so so what got you into color science? Like, what was there like an aha moment that you were like, hmm. holy crap! I need to look more deep into this or deeper into this. I I guess I think the moment came probably when when I realized that I was editing my own work and really all I was doing was like throwing on some like free LUT that I'd found on the internet mm-hmm. and I was like I was content with the results I was getting from that kind of process mm-hmm. I wasn't happy per se with how my images looked um and it really sent me down a spiral of just Wikipedia pages and journal papers and camera company white papers and things like that to Mm -hmm. learn about how an image is encoded within Mm -hmm. a camera. And it took, I guess, the pandemic of me having all this extra time, not commuting, not going out because we couldn't to really sit down with all this material and like absorb it all and Mm -hmm. like make sense of it and really what what's happening. And at the core of it, is really just signal processing. Yep. Right? It's it's yep. basically taking a signal and translating it into something else and then displaying it on on a screen if you're talking about color, right? You know. Mm-hmm. Um light into to camera into display is really the the chain that I really was interested in. Mm-hmm. And I think um when I I I was always curious about DaVinci Resolve as an editor um but i didn't see the full potential until i saw the color page being used and what you could do and how it almost felt like photoshop but for color colorists and people working with color and things that you could do to manipulate you know hue saturation and luma in creative ways and and that kind of stuff so i think it was more so a being unhappy with my work from a color perspective and b just wanting to know how that process happened like from a scientific perspective so that okay. was kind of it for me. I mean, yeah, that's cool. Like, it just kind of, uh, I think at the beginning of In Frame Podcast, I was like, went all downhill from there. Um, 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Down the rabbit hole is yeah. is the, uh, I guess, the term you could use for yeah, myself. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the thing is, too, is, you know, like, I remember, was this 2016, 2017, a lot of YouTube, uh, like, even travel videographers and stuff like that. Um, you know, they had, they were selling presets, you know, there was a specific look to make things a little more cinematic oh in a my way. God. That term also irks me a little bit. But. Yeah. Yeah. Give me that cinematic look. And a lot of the times that meant that teal orange gosh, yeah. kind of look. Well, that, that comes, that, that whole teal orange look is, um, is color theory, right? Like mm-hmm. contrasting colors look good together. You, so you have teal and orange, yeah. red and green yellow and purple if you're talking Mm -hmm. about secondary colors um and that's kind of where it stems from that's why like you know a lot of of movies um will sort of use contrasting palettes Mm -hmm. right to have their main characters stand out against their background or scene or environment yeah um teal and orange isn't the only look that will set apart Mm -hmm. um you know your character from a background or someone in a scene doesn't be, have to be the only palette. Like there's a lot of monochromatic palettes that, that have people have used um, in certain movies or a subtle, you know, teal and orange. Or if I look at someone like Roger Deakins in terms of some of his looks, they're very, I don't know, what, would I call it achromatic? Maybe like mm-hmm. you don't see that harsh contrast, but then you look at someone like Michael Bay mm-hmm. and like the initial Transformers, yeah. that teal and orange. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and I think that's very... where it started. Those Michael Bay movies <laughs> yeah. with Transformers and Shia LaBeouf and Megan Fox. Like, man. So it, it's kind of, they, they call it the Hollywood look, but I don't think it's the only look in terms of what mm-hmm. you can achieve with the tools of color correction or, or color grading. Yeah. Um, I will say though, the within the industry, I think color is one of the things that has not been democratized. So everything else has become so accessible, you know, getting access to an editing software. DaVinci Resolve is free, Mm -hmm. right? But it comes with this great tool that you can really enhance your image with, which is the color page. Um, Cameras have become more accessible. Cameras mm. that shoot raw have become more accessible. If you look at the Komodo 6K, it can be had for what, five, six thousand dollars? Yeah. And it yeah. shoots red raw. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because red owns a patent on raw. And so any other camera company that tries to make a raw format technically can't. There still has to be some processing it internally to avoid infringing on the patent that red has, is, mm. is what I've heard. So okay. um, yeah, like if, if you look at that, and even ProRes RAW with the emergence of that, which I think is, you know, um, it's great for creators, but it also comes with great responsibility. <laughs> I will tell, <laughs> it's true. Okay. Yeah. It is no, true. that is, that is I, fair. I think people have to understand that. It tell does me come you're with- a Star Wars fan without telling me you're a Star Wars fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, I think people have to understand that you have access to all these great things about image making mm-hmm. and I think you also have to understand that there needs to be some level of care taken with how you treat your image in order to get the best out of it. Yeah. So, well, like, so you mentioned, you know, just accessibility to stuff. Like, how is that, like, how do you think that's affected workflow? Because mm. dec- like a few decades ago, people that wanted to do- get into filmmaking, you know, could only shoot Super 16, Super, or super 8, 16 millimeter. Um, if they really wanted to get into studio format, you know, you got your 35. Um, but now, I mean, iPhone 13 has like ProRes, I yeah. think, and you can color grade. I'm not sure if it's 422 or whatever yeah. the format is. It, that's, that's, it's interesting. You know, it's um, technology has sort of helped that and, and kind of taken the barriers down in terms of, of filmmaking. So, mm-hmm. I mean, ProRes is just it's an encoding container, yeah. right? Like it all depends on what is coming from the sensor of the camera. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how that's encoded and that all depends on on the computer on that camera really that that processing unit on the camera and how that's packaged so i mean iphones yeah you can get great images out of them no problem um you know you can get really shitty images out of a sony camera too if you don't know what you're doing with it right Mm -hmm. and understand how that processing works so you know there is sort of uh, i guess there's a, a wide I guess, spectrum of things that go into making an image and getting a final um, 
image that you're happy with. And, mm-hmm. and I think that as more and more people get into the space, they're going to learn about more and more and things along that spectrum um, that contribute to sort of a great spectrum or scale, I guess, or path or whatever it is. But they'll, they'll understand what kind of contributes to that final image. Mm. Um, and from a color perspective, there are a ton of things that go into um, making a good image, you know, whether it comes down to how you debayer a raw codec like you know Mm -hmm. you can't really you have to really take that raw data and you have to tell it what it is you have to be like okay i want this to look like a certain gamma curve or i want this to look uh like i want this to live in a certain color space right so you have to tell that to all the raw image because it's just sensor data that's Mm -hmm. packaged and you have to debayer that how you debayer that's going to affect your workflow your post-production workflow right and it's going to affect your um your communication with say vfx and how vfx works and you know that kind of stuff so um there's a lot to unpack under the hood when it comes to understanding that part of of color science but Mm -hmm. um you know you can get a great image out of an iphone i'm not going to say no i won't deny it but yeah yeah. like i think i think recently i did a shoot and i sent you footage yeah all (laughs) iphone iPhone footage and um uh you know it was good footage um you know, you just had no way of really controlling exposure if you shot with the native camera app on iPhone. But yeah. you can get great stuff out of an iPhone, and I don't doubt it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy what people can do now. Mm-hmm. And I think I think the accessibility thing comes into play. Like, I, I think a lot of content creators now are using iPhones, and you know, even like the smaller, not even not the full frame Sony cameras, but they're even using. Uh, crop sensor i think is what the term is You're using mm-hmm. crop sensors and just creating amazing videos and whatnot a lot of it is just for youtube and and stuff like that but um yeah it's it's kind of crazy what you can get it what you can get with some of the technology now yeah absolutely um, so that being said i mean it's it's not always about the camera right it's all it's no. it, like your gear no. you know you could hand someone uh, that's experienced and has that knowledge, um, any kind of camera really, and they can pull an image out of it. Absolutely, but you have to understand the limitations of that camera. Yeah. Right. I I always stress that you're you're only as good as how well you know your gear. Yeah. And, and um, and also what 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 your gear needs to get great results out of. Right. Um, I think if you if you stick to one piece of gear or one camera and like you're familiar with like for me i'm familiar really familiar with the sony system Mm -hmm. but also as a colorist i have to understand how red works i have to understand how ari works i might have to understand how panasonic works and things like that so Mm. a lot of these camera companies release papers about all the encoding profiles that these cameras have in terms of like gamma color space all that sort of stuff so it's up to you really as as someone who's in that space to keep up with all that so you have the best understanding of of how all these things work okay. so yeah i mean that's kind of how i see it is you know it, it's kind of like if you're a scientist you know things change within your field mm-hmm. and you have to keep up with that yeah so it's the same way in, in in sort of the color side of the industry things change so fast because of the way technology is moving and i think this goes for any department really in our industry you have to keep up with what the manufacturers are doing at least on on paper and yeah. scientifically with what they're what they're saying so that you can adapt your workflow and, and things like that so mm-hmm Mm -hmm. Well, on the flip side of that coin, I mean, knowing how to use your camera and sort of the technical limitations or what its capabilities are, that's one side of it. The other side is really just kind of getting inspired because the thing is, too, is that when you're when you're doing color, um, you know, you could draw inspiration from just about anywhere. Really? Absolutely. So what what would you say is your source of inspiration? Like what kind of gets you going uh, and deciding in the field, you know, this is the kind of color. Like, I want to light it this way because I want the colors to be this way. <laughs> uh, I'll say three three movies. Um, <laughs> Lawrence of Arabia. Okay. Encounters of the Third Kind. Apocalypse Now. <laughs> um, I, I always go back and I think my love from color comes from my sort of history with film photography. Mm-hmm. And I think about the filmmaking process before we had digital tools. Yeah. And... What you would do, so what I've at least what I've learned that people did, is you would shoot on a negative stock, right? Mm-hmm. And for Kodak, they had tons. Agfa had tons, and there was tons of manufacturers that made negatives, including Fuji. 
and you would go develop that at the lab, right? And um, then you would make something called an interpositive. Okay. Okay. So you would go make an interpositive from that. Um, well, technically, you'd cut the negative altogether in, in a cutting floor and then make an interpositive from that. Mm-hmm. And then you that would be reviewed before final. Then you'd make an then you'd do all your printer corrections because you'd print on film stock yep. uh, for for projection back then. And um, you'd make an internegative of that interpositive, which was basically the entire movie on a negative. And that negative would be made would make would finally make the um, print mm-hmm. the final print uh, that would go to theaters around you know, the world. And it's interesting because a lot, of, a lot of people talk about getting that film look, which we all love and desire. And everyone thinks is so organic. But in my mind, like film is engineered to look good. It's made by humans. Yes. It's, it's, it's organic chemicals. Yes. But it's been engineered to look good. And, 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 and as much as people think, oh, yeah, it feels great. You know, it feels so organic. But the reason it looks that way and, and pleases so many people. Yeah. Because it's engineered yeah. to do so. So. I think about that film process and, you know, there's a lot of things that are out of con- out of your control in that film process. Like you could have two prints from the same lab look completely different. Mm-hmm. You're like, why? Right. So yeah. when a lot of, you know, color timers as they were back then got into the digital space and workflow, they're like, wow, I can get replicable results, you know, or repeatable results that I, you know, I'm always going to get this if I do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, I, I do like that film process. And of course we want to borrow and take from that process what we like, which is the color science of it. Right. You know, that photochemical process that, um, that that's sort of embedded on that acetate when light hits that sensor and you see this beautiful image. So for me, like watching a lot of movies that were shot on film, I think were, were was prob- probably my biggest inspiration. Mm. Um, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, everyone kind of looks at that film because it's also a huge negative and um i think it was 70 millimeter or 65 millimeter with super wide screen it was back 70. then it was 70 yeah. yeah so it looks great when it's projected and i think in toronto tiff does screenings with the 70 millimeter print which is like mm, i want to do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um also like guys like christopher nolan and mm. quentin tarantino who love to shoot film and who've carried on that tradition for People like me who didn't really understand that when I was younger, like, yeah, cool. I saw a movie when I was like eight or nine, but I didn't fully understand the entire process behind that. Now that I'm older and I watch these movies that were shot on film, it's like, oh, that's really cool. Like, Mm -hmm. and it's crazy because if you do a print stock, you're trying to match the digital intermediate to that print stock. So they they look very similar, right? Because that print stock is basically your look. Yeah. of a film so i would say film is probably a big inspiration and just like you know if you ask anybody like what are their favorite movies look wise they'll probably say a film that was actually shot, shot on, on 35 film. millimeter or something like that so yeah 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 for sure yeah i think even for me like there's quite a few movies um i yeah, mean space odyssey yeah 2001 space odyssey space odyssey great movie yeah i think space space odyssey's odyssey wow i can't speak uh that film in particular definitely inspired like christopher nolan inspired a lot of uh the directors and filmmakers of this generation really Mm -hmm. um even movies like star wars like i remember oh my gosh i remember listening to uh to a podcast and a lot of the people that were guest speakers on that podcast brought up the fact that star wars was one of those movies or series of movies that you know inspired them to get into filmmaking yeah. to get into um coloring and, and all that other stuff yeah and I, I think star wars was also they were shot in anamorphic lenses um and i think they were shot on panavision cameras if i recall mm-hmm. but also like stuff like that that just kind of inspires an entire generation right yeah so yeah it's kind of cool yeah okay cool um let me see I, what I else you like, got what i feel like we've Lux, covered <laughs> when we ask about presets and how i feel about presets because i can i can talk about that uh well yeah i feel like we covered a bunch of of the questions i had within that little chunk there uh, um uh, don't get me wrong i like lutz though i do but yeah I will, I will say <laughs> yeah like it's it's all part of the look dev process like if you talk mm-hmm. about look development for color it depends on where you're brought on as a colorist some people like some directors and dps have colorists that they work with throughout their entire career and they will only work with that colorist um and then you know that colorist also might 
So I think to sort of even separate the roles or tease apart the roles even more, you do have color scientists that can be part of the look dev process and they understand the math that goes on under the hood, right? Um, but I will say for the color process and look, a lot of it starts in pre-production, talking to the director, talking to, um, you know, art department, the production designer, all that. And then you shoot a bunch of tests and um, a color science, scientist might develop a LUT for you for like a show LUT or a movie LUT. And that's something you monitor your entire project with. Um, and then, you know, when it comes back to DI, you're basically tweaking underneath that LUT or mm. maybe after that LUT, depending on how you set it up and how that LUT is built. But those LUTs, LUTs are picky eaters, man. You have to feed it a certain type of footage. Like yes. you cannot use, like you buy your favorite YouTuber's LUT. Like, mm -hmm. don't think you can put that on any camera. Yeah. Like they might even say, it's like, oh yeah, I developed this for Sony camera specifically, but how do I know that how you exposed it is going to match what I shot? You know, like, mm. It's like, are they the same shooting conditions? Like that LUT will only apply if the shooting conditions are the same. Um, and there's a lot of things about like maintaining 18% gray for certain picture profiles. And uh -huh. um, when it comes to manipulating colors, like if you think about a LUT, it's a cube, right? In 3D space. And so there's, um, you have basically hue, hue saturation luma in this cube. And if you are making say a LUT for a 709 delivery or something like that, you have to keep things contained in that cube. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing things that are, you know, not in what we call a scene referred space, um, then you run the risk of absolutely breaking your image um, when you apply that LUT so that you can get a lot of artifacts and things like that. So I'm very careful about who people buy LUTs from and how they were developed. Cause I doubt these YouTubers are giving an explanation of how they develop their LUTs, right? Like no, probably not. It, it's in a way for them, it's just a, it's a, another way to, to generate income, which is fair. But you know, I always warn people like, just be careful. Like, do you know how it was developed? What footage they used, what their, you know, their, their picture profile was and you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, I get very weary for that kind of stuff it's because like also like it takes a lot of time to develop um a lot i think you know yeah. multiple tests and so I, I respect the process uh and i just don't think it's is as easy as some people make it out to be and no and i think i feel like LUTs are similar to vseo filters for yeah. lightroom and stuff like that like it's good to get to a certain point yeah if you really want full control you would probably go in and and like you know something like DaVinci, yeah, and and set up a sort of workflow process for sure. And I I don't, here's the thing: I started as a photographer. I could not tell you the color science and imaging processing pipeline for a photo as well as I could tell you for video. Like yeah. I couldn't tell you what happens to a raw photo when you apply a filter, but I can tell you what happens to a video when you apply a LUT or when you do a certain transform. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't know what what happens in a photo, like how those are those are those pixels and values like now in a container? Um, have you like reduced the color space or is that preset working in a in a, in a, in, a, in the same color space that the camera was working in? Like, I don't know any of that stuff as, as someone who started with photography, but for yeah. someone in video, like I can tell you that kind of stuff to, <laughs> in more detail so yeah well okay so for someone that's getting into color and up until this point has only known about LUTs mm. right what would be the next point for them like what are some tips what's some resource or something that I can go look at to go hey maybe I can go beyond LUTs maybe I go into DaVinci start learning about specific sure. transforms etc okay I would say number one DaVinci Resolve has free training like if you're getting into color grading, like there are many programs for color grading and color correction. Like DaVinci Resolve is, I would say by far the most accessible in my experience. There's um, Assimilate Scratch, which I think you have to pay for. I don't recall. And there's Baselight, which is I think uh, integrated with the Avid. And that's ridiculous mm -hmm. as well. Like to, to get Baselight if, yeah. if you don't have, if you don't go to like a film school or you, you don't have a discount or you aren't part of a big post-production, like, Base light is top tier stuff. Um, not saying that DaVinci isn't. Tons of commercials and short films and feature films have been finished with DaVinci, but DaVinci does have free training. And so there's a whole section on color 
that will take you through all the tools of color correction and color grading. Okay. Um, as well as there's a, I don't know, is it 1500 page manual of DaVinci Resolve? 1500. Uh, or 400 page. I don't recall what the number was, but it's a lot of pages. Yeah. If you feel like you could set yourself a goal and like, okay, I'm going to work through these many pages of DaVinci Resolve and understand every single tool that is there. Um, that's a good starting point. Also, if you're getting into color correction, there's one book I would recommend, which is the Color Correction Handbook by Alexis Van Herkman, who is a um, director and colorist, um, actually started out as a sound guy, believe it or not, uh, working in, in a post house. Uh, I, I think it was in L.A. or in New York. I don't remember where, but yeah, he started as a sound guy and then he was really good with After Effects and uh, got into color uh, and then people started paying him to do color jobs. And so he developed this handbook, which I think is a great starting point. It's a bit dated a great resource to start off with. Um, I would say stay away from YouTube. Like, <laughs> stay away from YouTube. Stay away from YouTube. There may be a few channels out there. Uh, yeah. I would say Cullen Kelly is one of them. He's actually a Black Magic like certified trainer. <laughs> okay. Uh, and also uh, Darren Mostyn. He's a pretty decent guy too. Mm-hmm. Um, who's uh, who's got some pretty good knowledge about color. So those are some of the resources I would say. And and at that point, like. Once you've got a good foundation, you know what sort of the rules and parameters and guidelines are. You can start messing with them and and getting creative with it and integrating certain things into your own workflow and playing with nodes and creating certain looks and things like that. So Mm -hmm. it's probably what I would recommend. Cool. Nice. Final question. Yeah. Because we're talking to people that might get into color grading or color correction. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing is their display, right? People, oh. a lot of people are looking at things on their MacBook or oh on their PC. Here we and, go. This is gonna be a whole other pot now. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I mean, again, like people are just viewing things off of whatever, and like you've mentioned earlier, yeah. nothing's really democratized in this space. Exactly, the display space is not democratized either. No. So, for someone that really wants to get started and just uh. kind of get into it. What's a good display or monitor or something that you recommend? Or are are the Apple displays okay enough to get started? <laughs> Fuck no. <Yes. laughs> um, okay, I'm going to explain what the correct way is to get the most accurate image. <laughs> Three hours later. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, you have to be in a dark room. Hmm. The wall that is where your screen is um where your screen is sitting the wall behind that screen should be painted 18 percent gray okay Okay? on the monitor that you're using you should have bias lighting just to prevent excessive eye strain the next thing is you should if you are considering or doing color grading as a professional and charging money for it um and will be charging money for it it's a hard thing to do freelance i will say it is hard to do freelance you can do it no doubt, but because of the cost of some of this gear, most people end up working at post houses that have the money and capital to set up these color grading spaces or what we call DI suites, Mm -hmm. digital intermediate suites. But if you were going to do it on your own, 80% gray wall, get bias lighting behind your monitor to help your eyes. The display is very important. You need a reference monitor. Okay. And there's Two companies that I'm familiar with that create great reference monitors, mm-hmm. uh, and that would be Flanders Scientific uh, okay. and and Sony. So Sony has the BVM monitor, which is top tier, thirty thousand dollars. Okay, not Jeez. something that someone's going to start with. Thirty thousand, dude. <laughs> yeah, and there are smaller screen sizes. That's a thirty-two inch, I believe. I think the eighteen inch is, I think seven or eight thousand dollars. Okay. So it's like okay, if you're getting some money from your 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 production business and stuff mm-hmm. like that then maybe you could look at investing into something like that uh on the flanders side i think the most affordable one is about three thousand dollars the flanders scientific dm 241 yeah the reference monitor is not only the, it's a good start it's good to have the reference monitor but that's not the only thing in the chain so you need to bypass the color management from your operating system right because that bias is what you're seeing on your screen so to do that you're going to need basically um, like a deck link card, basically it's like another graphics processor. It's like almost like another GPU, uh, where it, it, it decouples it from the processing from windows and, and Mac. So you would take the feed out of that. So usually you'd have an SDI out, um, not an HDMI out because SDI 
think can carry more data than HDMI. Um, so you'd have an SDI out that would go into a breakout box mm. and the breakout box would basically, it's actually a LUT box. So it, you, you can upload LUTs to it. And if your monitor can't accept LUTs, you'd have to use a breakout box because the monitor may be good, but it might have some junk that came with it. So when you calibrate it, you'd want to use a LUT in front of that to have the cleanest possible signal. But say that your monitor, um, and say, okay, say you use the breakout box and had multiple outs, you might have to use a LUT for another monitor that didn't have, didn't accept LUTs. But if it was going to your reference monitor, then you may not need a breakout box. And so you'd go to that reference monitor uh, and that would be the cleanest possible signal. And that you're not being biased by your, by your OS color. Um, and what you see on your reference monitor is the truest form of what basically the camera sensor saw on the day you shot. Um, mm -hmm. If it can re replicate uh, that image, right? Um, most of the reference monitors like we'll be mastering if depending on what you're doing, uh, we'll master for for Rec 709. And a lot of computer monitors can do Rec 709, but in some some instances, it's not as accurate as a reference monitor because of things like local dimming zones and you know getting pure blacks as black. Like if you look at certain monitors, you know in, in a dark scene, you might see blooming around the highlights. That's because there isn't enough dimming zones for it to get to pure black. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at say the Apple display and compared to the Sony monitor, like is nowhere near uh, as good in terms of color accuracy and in terms of getting the best possible, um, you know, say Rec 709 image as an example. Like okay. you, you'll notice blooming around the highlights and things like that you would see with um, prosumer or consumer monitors. Mm -hmm. If you wanted a monitor um, that wasn't a reference monitor, things like the, the BenQ, um, I think SW series are great. Uh, the Asus Pro Art are decent, but you probably want to calibrate it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that even goes for your reference monitors. They come calibrated out of the, the box, but you probably want to buy a probe and calibrate it as well. And you would calibrate for different scenarios. Maybe you might calibrate for P3 if, you're, if your monitor can handle that color space. Or, you know, for the most part, people will calibrate to Rec. 709. So the, the key is to, to, to get a good display, um, get good hardware to calibrate to get the most accurate uh, image and that would probably be the most important thing um you know i think learning the tools are great i think that that's key like you have to understand the tools first before you can kind of get to that point where you're gonna you know start investing in gear but um it's crazy because you know like i said that's one of the things that just hasn't been democratized um you have to pay a lot of money uh for hardware to do really good math is the way i think about it yeah that's fair <laughs> That but is yeah. fair. Cool. Yeah, I mean that's that's always good. Like you, you, you mentioned a reference monitor for thirty grand or seven yeah. grand. Yeah, but like, like that's a lot. You, you, you'll find that in a post house though. Yeah, like, you won't find that in yeah my but living room. No, but it's good to know like someone that's that's wanting to get into it. You know, they can easily find a monitor on the market. It might cost yeah. you a couple hundred bucks, but it's yeah. good enough to get started. And I think so. Like if you've got if you got a budget, like find a monitor. Five five hundred bucks under use a probe, but you're gonna have to calibrate very often, right? Yeah. If you can, I would say if you can't afford the reference monitor, you would probably be better off bypassing the OS uh, and using a probe uh, and going that route. So if you can do that, that's a pretty good start. And then just keep calibrating that monitor every month or so uh, when you're doing projects, or recalibrate before a big project or something like that. So yeah, probably a decent start, I would say. I don't know if that was 10 questions, but... No, it was just more me going on <laughs> tangents about color spaces. Um, no, but it's good. Again, like a lot of the stuff, I, I, even I didn't Let me know. ask you one question. Does this make you want to learn DaVinci Resolve now? Uh, you know what? Okay, so here, here's my thing with, uh, with that is... I feel like things are starting to pick up and I've I've got a whole other set of skills, which... I have a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Learning learning about color is a whole other... I have to dive yeah. You can watch it. The textbook's right there if you want to borrow it. I've got a textbook from the, Sir. the Alexis Van Herkman one. It's a fat <laughs> textbook. Sir, I don't know if I have the time. But it is it is super interesting. And the, and the fact of the matter is, is that, um, like, for example, certain projects that I'm working on, instead of me trying to do things the way i would normally do it for example recording in cine 4 don't space <laughs> oh my god yeah cine I, 4 is not 
No. A fucking encoding gamma. No, no, no. It is not an encoding. It's a Rec. 709 yeah. display gamma. But, okay? but but here's the thing. Like is, people don't know that. That's the thing. Like it's, you have to you have to educate yourself yeah. a little bit. But, right? but it's like but the thing is, I've got my gear. I've got uh, the way I, the way I light certain things and that sort of deal. So now learning more about how color space works and how things need to be done a certain way coming in, you know, there's a certain way of doing things mm-hmm. going from your scene, um, was it scene, scene space to scene display space, space. To display space. There's a whole, yeah, it's a pipeline, right? Exactly. So now knowing that there's a pipeline, um, you know, I would rather defer to somebody who knows those spaces. Like, you know, like a, a lot of the times now when I'm working on a project, um, even though I shoot city four, <laughs> knowing what I know now, I'll start shooting S log two, S log three, if I can yeah. trying to learn more about that. And then appreciating the fact that you can do a lot more yeah. taking those particular spaces. And then for sure. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you think about it, it's like, why cut your foot off? You know, if you have the opportunity to capture in a larger color space yeah. and a wider dynamic range, yeah. then do it right because you can always go back to it later on right yeah and remaster something that's what a lot of people you know have been doing like with with red like uh, i think all the red cameras if it's since the red one shot raw so now you can go and debayer that differently and you can get this entire dynamic range Mm -hmm. like it's kind of crazy what you can do with uh with certain films like i know david fincher is gone back and, and remastered some of his films for, mm-hmm. for HDR and stuff like that because now we have the technology. And if you shot in that sort of wide color space and gamut and um, encoding profile, then you're afforded that opportunity to go back, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a nice thing to do, I guess, in some cases. And, you know, yeah. But uh, yeah, don't shoot Cine 4, man. Come yeah. on. Just no, shoot S Log 2. Don't shoot S Log 3 because yeah. the 8 bit data is not yeah. great for S Log 3. And, so I mean, yeah, I, no, I'll, I'll spare you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been another episode of In Frame Podcast. Yes, thanks for listening, and we hope to see you next time on episode nine. <laughs> I think. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Listen everywhere where you get your podcast. Follow us on Instagram, and this will also be on YouTube at In Frame Podcast. I don't remember our handle. <laughs>